I want to start off by talking about a little bit about aging, because a lot of our fit fathers and fit mothers are really interested in living a long and thriving life. And you are 86 years young. You describe yourself as a super ager. So Mm -hmm. what does super aging mean to you, Jim? Well, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm 86 going on 60. (laughs) Uh, Basically, I I feel uh, I really feel that every day is a miracle. Uh, my late great mother taught me something years ago. She said, in the morning when you get up and you face your number one enemy in life, that's that person in your bathroom mirror, you have a choice. You can look at that person and scowl and growl and say in pain, good God, another day. Or you can smile sweetly at that person who could be a friend of yours if you really work on it, and say sweetly, good, God, another day. And I do that. It may sound a little corny, but I don't think of it as corny. I really think that every day is a miracle. I mean, there are no guarantees that we're going to wake up on the right side of the grass. Uh, So if you have that, you know, you have that opportunity to say, today I'm going to be better, I'm going to do better, I'm going to make life better, not just for myself, but for everybody around me. Hey there, my friend, it's Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, and I want to welcome you back to another episode here on the Fit Father Project and the Fit Mother Project podcast. This episode is truly special, and I would say it's one of a kind. Because in just a moment, you're going to hear a conversation between myself and one of our expert guests, Jim Flaherty. Jim is 86 years young. He's an author, a career businessman, a father, a grandfather. He is healthy. He is spry. And he's out there really just sharing his love for life with the world. In fact, he just authored a new book, Dear Old Friends, a loving reminder that the band won't stop playing till you stop dancing. And I wanted to bring Jim on because I, I think it's it's really important to learn from our elders. And Jim is a guy who, by my estimation, is doing it really right. I mean, he is approaching 90. He is out there writing books. He is talking to schools. He is so full of life. His body is energetic and strong. He's doing the right kinds of things to take care of his health. He's living in balance and moderation. And in a sense, I think Jim is the goal that many of us in the fit father and fit mother communities are striving for. We're starting in our 40s or 50s and our 60s to establish these habits to get the weight off to live healthy so that when we get into these twilight years of life, we still have amazing quality of life. Jim certainly does. And we get into a very powerful conversation uh, on a lot of things, uh, stories of Jim's life, but also some life philosophy, the golden rule, um, and, and and some of the things that Jim does to keep his body healthy. I know you're going to really enjoy it. I truly enjoyed it as well. And I also want to urge you, after l- listening to this conversation, if, if you feel very touched by what Jim shared and, and intrigued and you want to learn more, buy Jim's book. It's on Amazon. We're going to have links in the show notes. There'll be links in the description of this episode. It's called Dear Old Friends. You can also type in Jim Flaherty. F-L-A-H-E-R-T-Y into Amazon, and you can write Dear Old Friends, and you'll find this book. I recommend you pick it up. This man is full of lots of wisdom, and I'm excited to share this conversation with you today. All right, Jim. Welcome officially to the podcast, my friend. I'm so happy to have you here. I think you're officially going to be our oldest and probably our wisest guest to date. I like that part. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm happy to have you, and 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 I want to kick it off. I definitely want to talk about the book that you've you've written and and that you're promoting on these podcast tour. But I, I want to start off by talking about a little bit about aging, because a lot of our fit fathers and fit mothers are really interested in living a long and thriving life. And you are 86 years young. You, you describe bet. yourself as a super ager. So mm-hmm. what does super aging mean to you, Jim? Well, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm 86 going on 60. <laughs> uh, basically, I I feel. Uh, I really feel that every day is a miracle. Uh, my late great mother taught me something years ago. She said, in the morning when you get up and you face your number one enemy in life, that's that person in your bathroom mirror, you have a choice. You can look at that person and scowl and growl and say in pain, good God, another day. Or 
you can smile sweetly at that person who could be a friend of yours if you really work on it and say sweetly, good, God, another day. And I do that. It may sound a little corny, but I don't think of it as corny. I really think that every day is a miracle. I mean, there are no guarantees that we're going to wake up on the right side of the grass. Yeah. Uh, so if you have that, you know, you have that opportunity to say, today I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to make life better, not just for myself, but for everybody around me. Okay? Yeah. Jim, when did you start adopting this mentality? Was this something you've had your entire life or did it become more prominent as, as you body continued to age? Well, I, I think part of it, and I, and you know something, doctor, I don't know why it happened. My whole life, I had friends 20 to 50 years older than myself. I mean, when I, when I was a teenager, and believe me, I wasn't a hip, sexy, really out there teenager. I was a, a nice kid, a really good kid. I had the, I remember old hags. They were probably women in their 40s who used to advise me and talk to me. And when I was 40 years old, my best friends were 75 and 80. And I listened to them. And they'd say, turn left, turn right. Don't do that. That's stupid. Or that's great, Jim. That's wonderful. And you know something? They they um, they made it great to be Jim. And they taught me to respect my own decisions and also to think them out. I listened to them. They were smarter than I was. They had been there. Yeah. You know, whatever walls they had to climb, they'd already clumb. <laughs> mm-hmm. They'd done it. And uh, I hadn't done that Done that all. I, I, I just think it's very wonderful to look at every generation. I, I noticed I, I read a wonderful proverb one day, an African proverb. They say, when an elder dies, it's as if a library burns. You know, mm-hmm. so it's not that I'm that much smarter than somebody who's 50 years old, but trust me, maybe I've had to overcome more issues <laughs> than they have. And I maybe I have a different point of view. I, I look back now and I think it's too bad that companies start to retire people in their 60s because in truth, sometimes in your 70s, you're smarter. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jim, I want to I want to f- have a follow up question on that. Okay. At your age and your life experience now, what is most important to you in life? Okay. Um, I I'm a great believer. I was again. This goes back back to my my mother, who was widowed twice, but was really a, a terrific dame. She raised me with the golden rule, which we know started with Confucius, three hundred BC, but it evolved into a very awkward set of words with a good message: "Do unto others as you would have others do unto you." Uh, as a father, I had two little girls who are now 60 and 62. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very, yeah, it kills you when your children are in their 60s. Uh, <laughs> but I rewrote the golden rule, both for myself and for my children. And they still play it back to me, and they've used it with their own sons. I've got four grandsons and one great-grandson. Uh, it's very easy, five words. You get what you give. So in your daily actions, if you have lend a helping hand or you have a sympathetic ear or a generous heart or a warm embrace, you get that back. Mm -hmm. And if all you do is criticize and yell and demand and complain and spread depression, that also comes back to bite you, you know, where, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and so what What do I want? What do I think is important? I want, there are two things. For me personally, very important is I want every day to be productive. I know that sounds stupid, but I was not 
created to float around a pool with a margarita in my hand. Yeah. I really, I get up every day and say, wow, it's another chance to do something both for myself and for the world in general. And I really have to still produce something. So here I am at 86, as I said, going on 60, I'm still writing. And writing yeah. is not not easy. Writing requires everything has to work. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you really can't. And I don't, by the way, I don't wake up in pain. Everybody said, well, as you get older, you know, you're going to hurt all over. Huh? I don't hurt all over. I had, yes, I had a form of cancer years ago. And one year somebody knocked me over and I broke my femur and I had three operations on one leg and hip. I had rotator cuff stuff. It's okay. I did what I was supposed to do. I did all the PT. And I, and honest to God, Dr. Anthony, I can tell you, I do not wake up hurting. Now I'm fortunate. I realize. There are physical ailments that you have no control over. I mean, people develop rheumatoid arthritis Mm -hmm. or neuropathy, or they have spinal issues. Mm -hmm. Some of that is their own fault because they're overweight. They sit on a sofa. They don't do a damn thing. They Mm -hmm. don't move their bodies. But some of it is hereditary. I mean, DNA does have a lot to do with what we're going to, who we're going to be, right? I don't know. Am I I rambling or did I answer your question? You totally (laughs) answered my question. Well, I want want to talk about a little bit about what you do to take care of your body. um, And and what do you do for self-care? And I mean, and I don't even want to limit to your body because I just want to say self-care because body, mind, spirit, what are part of your self-care rituals and practices absolutely i mean first of all i believe that discipline is not a bad thing just as many people and i hope everybody reads there's a wonderful book by an admiral admiral mclaren Mm -hmm. i think his name was he 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 was an ex-navy seal and he wrote a book called make your bed (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I listened to his speech. He gave it as a commencement address at some university. And it's a terrific thing. And I, at 86, and I actually I've been doing this, I might add, for the last 50 years. I wake up in the morning between 7 and 7.30, and I roll out of bed, and I turn around and make my bed. Now, I am spoiled. I have a very sweet wonderful woman. She's my treasure, a 59-year-old little Mexican lady who has lived under my roof for 22 years. Wow. I call her the nanny. (laughs) And she still calls me Senor Jim, even though, (laughs) even though we're 22 years. I mean, she's, she's in my will. (laughs) I mean, we're, we're family. She's wonderful. And she says, you know, Senor Jim, I will make your bed. And I said, and you know, Esther, that someday you'll have to, (laughs) but until you have to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take something sloppy and make it neat. That's going to be the first thing I do with the day. Then I I get up, wash my face, I go out and sit down and I have the same breakfast every day, which may sound boring, but I'm it's really terrific. It's a great way to start the day. I have a big almost a double portion of freshly cut up fruit. Yeah. With homemade applesauce on it, which has nothing in it. It's just apples. Nice. And I have no rough muffins, no toast. No, nothing. I have that. I have black coffee and I go down to the pool and I do 30 minutes of serious exercise, not swimming laps. I, I exercise in a 10 by 10 area with yeah. weights and I'm doing deep knee jogs and doing all this stuff in shoulder deep water Yeah, and do 1200 high knee jogs. Yeah, And I do all that 30 minutes of it, come up, take a hot shower, change for the day and I start my day. Okay. That's a very nice, healthy part. Yeah. I used to have lunch and then dinner. 
I decided I don't have that. Uh, this up to last June, I was taking care of a partner who had dementia. And I did three years of taking care of somebody with dementia. And that, if you want to put a strain on your life, you think it's the end of the world, you know, and you it's 24-7. And that's mm-hmm. what I did for three years. I didn't really live. I just was there to take care of somebody. Mm-hmm. So now I have my new schedule. I have my wonderful breakfast, exercise, I'm clean, I'm ready for the day. And I have my one other meal of the day is between two and four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And it's dinner. It's not yeah. lunch. I have a full dinner. Yep. I will sit down today. I we we've scheduled dinner today for two thirty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and i we're having ahi tuna <laughs> and nice. Wonderful vegetables and a great salad. I mean, a terrifically yeah. healthy dinner. I have, you know, some, I laugh. I say some people do marijuana and cocaine. I do ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have a big serving. It's a low calorie ice cream, but it happens to taste very good. And I have that as my dessert. And if I'm still hungry at eight o'clock at night, I sometimes will even have a little more ice cream. Yeah. But I can tell you, I know that. Weight control is very much a uh, a part of your business, yeah. doctor. Yeah. This morning, I weighed myself, knowing that I'm going to be on <laughs> on with you today, and I weighed 167.7 pounds. Now, you have to know when I was 22 years old and six three and a half, I went into the army, weighing 190 pounds which wasn't bad for six, three and a half, right? Yeah, right. At the end of basic training, which is eight weeks of nonstop exercise and hikes and this and that. I mean, I thought I was going to die. I, you know, I was so such a civilian for me to go through basic training. And I remember standing there and the CEO saying, besides the fact that you all men are going to be fine soldiers and giving us all that crap, <laughs> He said, I want you to know something that right this minute, so you remember it your whole life, right this minute, you're at the best weight of your life. And I weighed 175 pounds. Okay, now I'm two and a half inches shorter. You shrink (laughs) as you get older. Fortunately, I started out tall, so I'm still six foot one, and I weigh 160 pounds. 167 or 168 pounds. It goes back and forth, which is good. You know, oh, and yet I, I don't have a six pack anymore. It looks more like uh, an unpacked case of insure. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I still, I still have a waistline. I don't, I, I don't look like I'm seven months, seven months pregnant. Yeah. I don't like that look for a man. I think it's, it's terrible, and I never wanted to have it. And my children said, "Thank you very much for forcing us to never, to le- never letting us eat <laughs> eat anything." I said, "You aren't you glad? Otherwise, you would just be big fat cows walking around, and I would I would be very unhappy with it." Um, so, I do think it's important. I think that's very much a part part of taking care of yourself. That and well, we can get into it. You might want to talk about I we can talk about having a passion. Yeah. Having having a reason, having a reason to wake up. Well, let, let's get into that right now too. I mean, your routine is absolutely fantastic. Uh for sure. And it's, it's a wonderful. And I also really love how you've adapted your movement to be exercised in the pool. I mean, that's probably the best you're moving your joints in a way that feels great. Let's talk about the passion side of things. And also uh, I imagine that gets into why you wrote your book, dear old friends, a loving reminder that the band won't stop playing till you stop dancing. So let's, let's talk about passion and let's talk about your book and, and kind of what drives you and and the importance of that. Uh, Absolutely. I, you know, uh, when I wrote in, in the book, one of the one of the chapters is called "The Importance of Passion," and I'd say, no, 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 not the sweaty kind. <laughs> I mean, the the kind that really it it's a passion for doing something instead of just watching TV. 
How about learning, getting up in the morning and thinking, I'm going to learn how to paint. I'm going to write. Maybe I can start a small business with my friends. I can learn how to swim. You don't know how to swim? Shame on you. Everybody should know how to swim. I mean, that's a a rule. Maybe I'll learn how to play bridge. (laughs) I'll learn a new language. I have a friend, she's 83 years old, and she's working on getting her first college degree. And oh, she said, she said, it's fantastic, Jim. She said, I'm in, I go to class in this community college and the kids look at me and they say, Jesus Christ, should we rush <laughs> up with a wheelchair? <laughs> and she's in there and she said, and I'm getting more out of the courses than they are, I think. And she's yeah. loving it, loving it. And she's getting a degree. I've, I've gotten other friends to start a book club. Yeah. I said, very easy to get a book club going. I've, As a writer, I who have written two novels and now this nonfiction book, I belong to a a writer's group. And we're eight people that were from different planets. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they're nice Christian ladies that live in the mountains of North Carolina and and Texas and in Wisconsin. And we all love each other. It's become group therapy. And we say things to each other that we wouldn't say to our best friends. Yeah. <laughs> and it's terrific. You know, or, or I tell people, volunteer. You'd be amazed how much help your church needs, your hospitals need, your school. I recently I got to teach a sixth grade class in the school. Somebody said, We have no teacher. I live in a small town. And uh my nanny is studying for her citizenship test. And it's a wonderful book that they give them with 100 questions, and they have to know all the answers, even though the the interviewer will only ask her 10 questions. She has to know all. And I'll tell you, anybody who really studies that would know more about the government and the Constitution and everything about America than any Americans do. Yeah, and and so I took that book and I used that as my study guide, and we talked about how many amendments there are, and what the Constitution stands for, and how many states. And amazing, what the kids didn't know appalled me. Mm-hmm. I thought, Good God Almighty, what are they talking about? Are they just looking at television and not seeing anything? I mean, I want. I want people to understand. I want them to, and to, and in terms of passion, I want them to, to do something. The whole act of knowing that you're going to wake up and that you've got something to do, something to work on, it's great. You know, because yeah. a, a happier, a happier outlook is a healthier outlook. Yeah. You know. So with your with your book writing, was this something that you knew from a very young age? You had a passion to write and express your thoughts and feelings in words? Or is okay. this something that found you later in life? Uh, I'll, I'll back up to one quick story. When I was 13 or 14, my father died when I was 14 going on 12. I was, again, not a real hip kid. And he yeah. was district attorney of the city of Miami, right? So I was the DA's son, which was mm-hmm. kind of neat. And the school gave me an option as I entered high school. You could take this or that. or And one of the option courses was typing. And I mentioned it to my father. And he said, good, Jimmy, you're going to take typing. And I said, typing? Daddy, only girls take typing so they can become secretaries. And he said, this is 1949, 1949. He said, Jimmy, the world will be run by keyboards. (laughs) Now, <laughs> mm. what he knew back then, yeah. I don't know, he knew as a DA, he knew how to type. He even knew Greg shorthand, which he yeah. used to use in court. So anyway, I took typing, and I did lean toward journalism in high school, and then I went to University of Florida for two years. I'm from South Florida, by the way, mm-hmm. Coral Gables, Florida. Mm-hmm. And I went to University of Florida two years, and I... I went to my counselor and I said, what am I going to be when I grow up? And he said, well, you could get a job in a small town Florida newspaper and you'd hate it, Jim, because you're not one of us. You're really not a Southern boy, which is true. Coral Gables was a Yankee town and I had Midwestern parents. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. He said, why don't he said, why don't you look at this new course of study? Only two schools in America offer a degree in it. It's called communications. <laughs> <laughs> Which now every roadside chapel and garage offers right. a degree in communications. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was Colgate or Michigan State, and I wrote Michigan State, and they gave me a full tuition scholarship on wow. ready. I played bassoon. I was the concert. <laughs> I was the can- concert bassoonist. Anyway, I went to Michigan State. I got a degree in in communications. I came to New York and got a job. Thirty four hundred dollars a year. Wow. I took home two hundred dollars a month after taxes, and I had no allowance from home. And I was living in New York City, so I know what it's like to live on the where every nickel really counts. Anyway, I got a, I eventually got a job as a copywriter mm-hmm. in an advertising agency, and I worked mm-hmm. hard at it, and I liked it. I thought, this maybe this is what I should do. And I kept working at it, and I worked, and I worked, and I became a, a copy supervisor and then a group head. And suddenly, I was in the corner office as the creative director. Mm-hmm. And... I spent 30 years in advertising, and the last 20 of them were as a creative director. And even once I was hired by J. Walter Thompson, they sent me, my wife, and two children to Argentina, to Buenos Aires, Argentina, 6,500 miles to live there for four years as wow. creative as creative director. So it was so writing was something I did. I was paid to be a writer. Yeah. And I and I loved it. Then in later years, I thought, gosh, maybe I should have lived in a garret in a basement and suffered and tried to write novels. I don't know whether I had that talent. So I gave myself the assignment of writing a novel, and I wrote two novels. They're not bad. I've never publicized them. I'm, they're published, and they're pure fiction. You know, birth, death, romance, sex, mm-hmm. international travel, Broadway, all that stuff. Yeah. But the book I wrote now is more important. I wrote this because I, 44 years ago, I sat down and wrote a love letter to all my old friends. And I titled it, Dear Old Friends. And I read it and I smiled at it and I filed it and forgot it. I had two kids in college. I had a new business. I had an ex-wife who I was very supportive of and we had a very good relationship I was starting a new business. I was out of my mind. Anyway, I found the manuscript last year, and I still liked it, and I rewrote it and added to it and added the subtitle of the band won't, a loving reminder, the band won't stop playing till you stop dancing. And I realized I'm now one of them. I'm a dear old friend to Mm -hmm. many, many younger people. So I could write it from two Viewpoints, one of a 42-year-old <laughs> who was writing to his old friends yeah. that he loved, and one as a 86-year-old who understands what it is to be growing old. So the book is about living. It's about living every day. And I, and I say in the book, you know, today, this very minute, you are the oldest you've ever been and the youngest you'll ever be. Yeah, And so let's... Make something happen. Make learn to love life. Learn to learn to respect every day and to get the most out of every day. <clears throat> and I really do. I, you know, and yes, art it doesn't mean everything. There are always violins playing and birds are <laughs> chirping. No, there's a, crap happens. And and some families, I <clears throat> it kills me. You know, they <clears throat> pardon me, where somebody develops a deadly cancer, right? And damn it, it it kills you. I mean, there's not a, a Sunday. I'm a I'm a collapsed Catholic, by the way. <laughs> mm-hmm. My uh, my rabbi friend called me that a collapsed Catholic, and I'm an elder in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the poor Presbyterians have got some old collapsed Catholic calling the shots. Anyway, it works. And every Sunday I, I pray, please 
don't let anything happen to the people I love and to my children and to my grandchildren, because I know how hard it would be to overcome an obstacle. And what do you do when you're facing an obstacle? How do you handle it? You know, and can you give yourself enough oomph to face it? You know, and, and I say to people, don't do it alone. Share it with your friends and listen to advice and talk to your primary physician. And, and, and also look ahead. I tell everybody now, especially where I, so many of my friends are older, I say, are you prepared for what's coming next? Are you going to need somebody to live with you? I would rather you didn't live alone. I don't think elderly people should live alone. I think it's a very unhealthy situation. Either and I and and my one of my daughters says, "Daddy, you can come and live with me." And I say, "I'd rather take gas." <laughs> she, said, <laughs> she says, "I I was expecting that kind of loving remark from you." <laughs> I said, "No, I I love you dearly, and you have your life, and I have mine." And we spend time together and we have a great time together. And fortunately, I have a nanny. And if I didn't have my nanny, I would put myself into one of these, I call them elderly resorts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're elderly residential centers. Yeah. And some of them are quite, quite beautiful and very nice. And they have independent living, assisted living, a dementia wing, and Alzheimer's wing, Mm -hmm. you know, so that every so you can't put everybody together i mean you you don't really want to live with uh wheelchairs and walkers which i did for the last three years that right. was because i was caring for that okay yeah. uh where else can we go well <laughs> i have a question i have a direct question for you on this to follow up is Shoot. how does one overcome obstacles and remove fear. And I, I want to think back and I'm going to reflect on a little bit of my personal situation right now. You had okay. those three, you had those three femur operations in, in surgeries, among other things that have happened to your body. I imagine when that happens, you're both feeling the challenge itself, like accepting this is what it is, but also working on maintaining a positive attitude. And I think that can apply to many other situations as well. How does, how do you believe someone creates this positive, healthy mindset that can overcome obstacles and fears while also still being very real with what's happening? Well, again, I, this is me. It's not everybody, but I yeah. do share this advice with many of my friends who are, I'm not sure what to do, blah, 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 talking about what, what might happen to their life. And I, I said, let's think in terms of poker or bridge. You play the hand you're dealt. Yeah. And not every hand is, it's, easy when you have a winning hand say fine buff give me your chips i win i've got a healthy body i've got a healthy head i win you lose and i win fine so suddenly you find because you're of your dna you're as this is happening to two of my friends their eyesight is going Mm -hmm. and i think how how can that possibly happen? They said, Jim, it happened. My mother went blind, and I am going blind. And one of the a fellow is a brilliant painter, and he's going blind. You know, and I think th- that's really unfair. That's <laughs> that's terribly unfair. It would be like for, for me if anything happens to my hands, I get yeah. very nervous. I've had trigger finger surgery mm-hmm. where they've had to go and. <laughs> Yeah, give me cortisone shots in joints and wants to have surgery to open a finger and because it makes me nuts if I can't type if I if I lose if I lose the use of this thing this this is my machine gun in life yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know then I'm lost and I, when I say to people when you're when you come up against that first try to analyze what choices you have the best possible choice is this you know and you see is that possible can you afford it is there a way of doing it do you have the right support system to do it if not what else can you do but first try to analyze it and get help talk to somebody about it talk you may have friends who have a brilliant idea or 
everyone should hopefully in their life have a good primary physician that can give them some advice, whether he can cure them or not, yeah. give them advice or a good, they don't, uh, I'm not knocking a minister because in my case, our, my minister happens to be a Yale scholar and he's absolutely brilliant and he's become a good friend, you know, and uh, I mean, you face, again, you play that hand you're dealt, you get it. Yeah. And there's there, uh, you have no guarantees that every hand is going to be a winner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. I think there's elements of acceptance there and also creativity and resource and, and pulling in other people's ad- advice and analyzing things. But I, I mean, I, I imagine acceptance is a big, is a big part of it. Thinking about your, your painter friend. Thank you. you. Know? That's, yeah. Thank you, uh, doctor. That's very much a part of part of it. And I've been discussing that with, because I have a lot of uh, single elderly friends, mainly women. There are more uh, widows than there are widowers. And I say part of it is acknowledging your age. I acknowledge my age. Recently, I went into New York. I I still have an apartment in New York. I'm trying to sell it because Mm -hmm. I realized I don't belong in New York anymore. I live in the country. My house is a converted barn, mm-hmm. you know, and I I love it. And I'm in a town of 2,600 people, and it's quiet and calm and easy, and nothing happens. Then I go into New York, a city I absolutely loved, and it turned little Jimmy from Curl of Gables into Jim, get out of my way. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And and I, I grew up professionally there, and it's a great competitive environment. So it was good for me. I mean, in New York, you can't be mediocre if you really want to get ahead. You've got to be able to fight your way through. But... um, Acceptance, right? I mean, it is accept- it is, it's acceptance. It, it's knowing I, I mean, I acknowledge that I'm 86. And that yeah. if I went into New York tomorrow, I would take a cane with me. Because I, where I used to walk all over the city, I don't really want to walk all over the city <laughs> anymore right now. And it's, and it's hard. There's crowds and people are pushy yeah. and, <laughs> you know, uh, by the way, I, this is on, on or off that question. I have another quote in life that I've absolutely loved and absolutely bought into. I, I don't want to forget it today while we're talking, Dr. Um, Noel Cowers, the British wit and wag and writer and actor and all the kind of things that he was, years ago had a line that I totally bought into, and I still buy into it at my so-called ancient age. It's really quite wonderful. Work is much more fun than fun. Yeah. <laughs> and it is. You know, I mean, I think there's, it's, it is good to have fun. I know people say, but damn it, Jim, I've worked all my life and now I want to do something. I say, fine, get Lucille and pack up and take a one month cruise. Yeah. And, and it's great, but then get back to doing something. (laughs) You know, life cannot just be one cruise after another, after another, after another. I did all that in my sixties and seventies. I I did take time off. I we had a villa in Acapulco. Nice. You know, and I did take cruises and I traveled a lot and I loved it. I loved it. One year we had some unexpected money from sale of a property and I booked I had never been to Southeast Asia and I booked a seven week trip to Southeast Asia so that I could really absorb it. I love and I absolutely loved it. I don't want to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Not now. Uh, Jim, I have a question for you. Do you, yes, do you feel that do you feel that work that we do m- needs to be have an element of being shared with others to be meaningful? Like if you were writing these books or if you were your friend and you were painting and you merely wrote or painted for yourself in your room, in your barn, wherever you're at, you create, and it's important to you, but it's not shared. Is that as meaningful or is that 
Is there an element of the fact that we're supposed to create and share that brings life meaning? Oh, I think you're absolutely right, doctor. I think to say, no, I I just do it for myself, that's BS. No, I think if you if you're creating, whether you're a, a complete amateur, if you're painting something, it, great. If you can get a group of people to paint. My mother uh, was a painter, and she was living in an, in an adult community the last 10 years after being widowed the second time. And she taught painting. And the people loved it. She said, they... She said, I, I charge them $4 for a three-hour course. <laughs> you know, I said, okay. She said, otherwise, they don't take it seriously. But if they put out $4 each, then it's good for them. And, they, and everybody loved it because they were painting together and they created something. And I feel the same thing about writing. Uh, I write a blog now and then. I sent out a blog yesterday, uh, which was very interesting to me. And it was written to aging women, you know, and it was a, it was a blog, uh, a very serious blog. And, Mm -hmm. and it was good for me to write it and, and to be, and to discuss to the women that ran it and the, the ramifications of what what they were writing and what they were sending out. I think that's terrific. I, I love what you're doing. You're talking to people about a subject I have totally bought into my whole life. Yeah. I I think that being fat or obese is dopey. I mean, it's just it's not necessary. People say, "Well, it's, it's just I can't help it, Jim." I said that. I'm trying to clean up my language instead of say the normal things I say to them, but that's absolute nonsense. Everything is controllable. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, if you, again, it's taking discipline. It's, it's looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, Hey, they, I don't, I don't like that person. And I know it's not healthy. And Everybody knows it's just not healthy. And so what you're saying is they're, they have good, healthy habits, and whether they're eating habits or exercise yeah. habits. I mean, I, it, to tell the truth, doctor, it annoy, I, one, if there's one thing that annoys me, it annoys me that I can't pound the desk and say, well, it doesn't matter. I've got 20 more good years. Well, <laughs> I'm afraid that's not true. Mm-hmm. You know, I... Even though I have no inclination or indication that I'm going to check out for good tomorrow or the next day, I know the body can do strange things to you. Right yeah. now, my heart is healthy. I don't, I, I had, a, by the way, I did have epilepsy mm-hmm. <laughs> three or four years ago. I, I take a pill for it mm-hmm. three times a day, and it's, Never ever bothered me, mm-hmm. and I expect, and I'm hoping to have another five or six good years of being able to do all this, to to be able yeah. to write and to talk and to you know to do everything. What's the guarantee? I I don't know that. You know, uh, life life will end <laughs> at the right time, and you hope it, that it will end. Uh, quietly and not, be, and that you won't be a pain in the neck to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well said. I have, I have a few more questions to wrap up this combo. Jim, Please. the first one is, was there a particular age in your life where you started to view time as m- being much more precious? Like you, the way you speak about time now and the day is a miracle and a gift and you get up and you're able to really experience that is true for yourself. Was that the same mentality you had in your 40s, in your 50s, in your 60s? Was there a point where you started to make these shifts in your relationship to time? Uh, that's very interesting. I I don't think it was part of my mentality in 40s and 50s because to tell the truth, doctor, I was so... Busy at age 48, I bought an abandoned stack of stone and with one partner converted it to a country in quote and conference center in a 
town that nobody knew about. <laughs> and everybody said, you're out of your mind, Flaherty. And I left New York and left a big six-figure salary mm-hmm. to come up and do nothing. And I worked 70 hours a week for 25 years doing that. Wow. 70 hours a week. 80 many weeks. 70 was the norm. I was there at 7 o'clock every morning with coat and tie on saying, good morning. <laughs> Did you sleep well? And we got up to earning four and five stars and got to be well-known nationally and internationally. Wow. And it did very well. When I hit 60, I went through a mental thing of, wow, all of the Flaherty men, all of them, had died before 60. All of them. And I thought, hmm, I'm here at 60. Am I going to kick off? (laughs) And I I knew I had done one very, very smart thing 60 years ago when I was still in my 20s, standing outside of a hospital in Brooklyn waiting to see my new baby child, my second daughter. I was smoking one of my two-pack-a-day cigarettes, and I this was the year before it caused cancer. It was 19, <laughs> 1962. Okay, 1960, you were safe then. <laughs> in 1963, they said, hey, smoking causes cancer. And, you know, it was 62, and I was standing there, and I said, you know this is bad for you, and you know you don't want, you know that sucking something down in your lungs has got to be bad, and you know you don't want either of your children to smoke. I was talking out loud. I still do that. Maybe I like the answers better. <laughs> and I took it, and I put it out, and I never smoked again. And, and... I know that's one of the reasons I'm still here. For sure. And, and then, by the way, I, 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 when I turned 80, I use 80 as a good kickoff. But when I turned 80, I stopped drinking. Mm-hmm. I wasn't drinking. Hell, you can't drink too much when you're in 80s because you fall over. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I thought I really don't need to have. And instead of just having a cocktail and a glass of wine, I suddenly didn't have to work. And I was having two cocktails and right. two glasses of wine. And I thought. This is stupid, Jim, and you really don't need it. And I stopped. And I, I love seltzer. I have seltzer all day long, yeah. and, I re- and I really like it. And that also is a great way to, by the way, controlling weight, stop drinking. Yeah. You'd be amazed. My God, alcohol sure. turns the sugar in your system. Yeah. You know, you instantly lose weight. So, um, yeah, I think from 60 on, I started thinking, Hmm. If you really want to live a long, productive life, and I had, I have to have that word productive, that's part of me, then you've got to discipline yourself and make some rules for yourself and follow them and, you know, get to bed at decent hours and not, not be boring. I didn't lead yeah. a boring life. God, I ha- I've had a lot of fun. Yeah. I've really had a lot, a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm still mentoring groups. I Recently, I had to mentor a group. Uh, AA asked me to come in to mentor a group of guys. They were 20 to 30. They were having career problems. They'd had drinking problems. They were getting over that. They were this and that. And I heard the guy introducing me. They, they hadn't seen me yet. I was kind of standing out of the classroom. And he said, and Mr. Flaherty has been a successful businessman in the area, and he's had two careers. He's an advertising and an innkeeper and all these things. And, and by the way, he's 80, he's 85 years old. This is last year. He's 85 years old. And I heard some of them say, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I was sorry I didn't have a walker so I could walk in with the walker, bend yeah. over, and then throw it off the side and then talk to them. As is, I walked in. I didn't say hello. I walked in and told a joke. And when they were all laughing, I, and I used the joke then to lead into a point that I wanted to make, and it worked out fine. And mm-hmm. I I love that. I love to be able to. And I'm I have I'm assigned right now. I'm going in to uh, mentor or speak to some of the groups. Some of the most expensive private schools in the country are all around the small town where I am. Hotchkiss. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of Hotchkiss? I've heard of it's it. Sixty thousand dollars a year for grade school. Wow. Right. And yeah. I'm they're going to have me come in and talk to the business group and the something group because 
I I can tell them this this uh, work is much more fun than fun. I also can talk about the importance to me of being on time. I, I'm one of those that says, if you arrive someplace on time, you're late. Mm-hmm. You know, be an hour early rather than five minutes late, but mm-hmm. don't be late. I went to work an hour and a half early my whole life when I was taking home $200 a month and when I was earning $150,000 a year. I yeah. still went to work an hour and a half early. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jim, this conversation, amazing. I mean, I've got personally gleaned so much from this and I want to thank you for sharing. And I also oh. want to, I want to say, where, where can people find your book, Jim? <laughs> <Ta-da>! <laughs> this yeah. Is the, this is not the, the book. The book is much smaller. It's, uh, this is the book. Uh, it's on Amazon. You go to Amazon and you can type in dear old friends. If you could remember the subtitle, a loving reminder, the band won't stop playing till you stop dancing. Or look under Amazon and James B. Flaherty, F-L-A-H-E-R-T-Y, and um, you'll find the book there, both for your your Kindle or as a paperback. And and it's not expensive, and it's not a hard book to read. You can actually read the book in a couple of hours, two and a half hours, three hours. But I guarantee that you cannot read the book without coming away with one, two, five, or ten ideas for making your life better, happier, more worthwhile. Jim, thank you so much. I'm excited to to dive in and fully read your book, especially after this conversation. I appreciate you so much for coming on here. We will also link Jim's book in the show notes of this episode, wherever you're watching this, where you can find the show notes. There'll be links to Amazon where you can find Jim's book. And Jim, Great. thank you. Thank you for being a super ager, for being a, a man that is able to provide so much wisdom and perspective for being an elder for us. And I, I truly appreciate this conversation today. It's been terrific, Anthony. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jim.